the Irrational Confidence Podcast. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Irrational Confidence Podcast. We're talking college football, and it is finally here, the best weekend of the season. It is rivalry week. We're not going to come at you with just one episode this week. Heck, we're not even going to come at you with two episodes. We are going to have three different episodes for you this week covering all of the fantastic games that we have for Rivalry Week right now. And I'm joined by my co-host, the man that got in trouble in Hawaii for laughing too loud. They only allow a low ha-ha. My co-host, Fresh. Fresh, how you doing, buddy? I'm still awestruck, uh, drunk, if you will. I'm not drunk and toxic, but just drunk as in watching all that college football happen this past week and all the craziness, the chaos, the upsets, the almost upsets. Um, this is exactly what the college football playoff committee wanted. This is what ESPN and ABC and, uh, and the broadcasting companies wanted is constant dialogue. Every team being, you know, for the most part being in it, at least you have 20 schools in right. it. Upsets come into play, obviously rivalries and hatred ruining people's seasons. It is magnified to the core. Um, and if we saw what we had last week, expect rivalry week, ch- conference championship week, and obviously the playoffs. So just continue to keep elevating that intensity um, as we move forward down the year. Yeah, it, this is in chaos. As I as you texted in our group message the other day, a year ago, wow, chaos is hitting. I go, this is past chaos. This is sheer anarchy. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen, sign me up. I'm excited for this year as well. Fresh, I, I still can't believe what we saw last night, especially something like is teams like Florida who are playing with everything for next year team like Oklahoma that's been completely disappointment Arizona State like coming like Arizona State is the backstage run in with a steel chair sliding in and taking out someone in a championship match not only one week but two weeks in a row listen forks up for the sun devils man i'm 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 loving that well, and you got Kansas, who's the first team ever to win three straight, uh, pull off three straight ranked up, um, upsets. It's just love it. You got to keep, you got to keep playing football. You have to tackle. You have to show up, execute, 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 or you're going to get beat. Um, and we literally had a scenario yesterday where Georgia and Tennessee fans were actively rooting for Florida to beat Ole Miss. Um, never would this have ever probably happened in most realms of possibility in the past. But now you're having to put aside rivalry and hatred for a three-hour window to get your own path to the playoff and keep it open. Fresh, let me ask you this question before we get rolling into the first set of rivalry games here. Which team do you think is going to look back on this season? And it's almost like the coulda, shoulda, woulda. Like they, on paper, you think probably had the talent to compete for the playoff spot, but whether it was injuries or Things just didn't go their way. They got a bad matchup. I'm I'm really between two, but what are your thoughts real quick? Uh, for me, it's top off Ole Miss. Um, you know, you invest in the portal for multiple players. You let Judkins leave, um, but you use that money NIL-wise to go after a plethora of players to so- solidify and supplement that depth. You have everything lined up for you. Your schedule was not impossible. Um, but somehow you lose to Florida, who's now six and five, and you lose to Kentucky, but you beat Georgia by two touchdowns. Um, this is a complete waste for Ole Miss. Lane Kiffin, that entire staff, um, you know, we can't, I think months ago we were talking about, oh, Lane Kiffin was a hot name to go to Florida. And then in our preview episode, it's ironic because Billy Napier got to vote of confidence. Lane's coming in now. All he has to do is win. He keeps moving on. And now he's the coach who has three losses and lost a playoff opportunity. And Billy Napier has the confidence of his team and of his fan base right now going forward into 2025. Um, the table's definitely turned, and it's, it's going to be a lot for the Ole Miss fans and the NIL collective that they committed all that money to make the, make the playoff, make the SC Championship game, and they couldn't even achieve either of those goals. Right. Um, that's, a, that's a serious look-in-the-mirror moment right now for Ole Miss. It's weird because no one's going to talk about that costing Lane Kiffin his job either. No, that won't. I mean, there'll be he's he's a great fit for there. He's the best I think Ole Miss can do from a head coaching perspective and a, and a vibe and an image. Right. With that team getting over the hump, um, it, you may think Alabama has a three loss season. 
Oklahoma's terrible. Mississippi State's terrible. Arkansas, eh, they're going bowling. Auburn, eh. You have a chance in the old SEC West, they would have been elite. But the Texas and you know, Texas A&M are there doing their thing. And you mm. just can't get over the top and take care of your own business. Um, it's a, it's a culture shock right now in Oxford. For me, it's Kansas. Kansas is that team because we recognize them at the start of the season, saying how much talent they did have on that team. And for some reason, the start of the season was just such like, it was almost like they were stuck in the mud and they're driving a stick shift car and they just can't, can't get it to catch. Like they, they're sitting there trying to get out of the mud, out of the mud, out of the mud, and they're not able to do it. And then all of a sudden they get out of the mud and they're looking back at their record and go, man, our record's really crap. We can't compete for the big 12 title at all, but you know what we can do? We're not going to let the wheels fall off the car. We're not going to let being stuck in the mud wreck the car. What we're going to do is we're going to show you what this car could have done. We're going to show you what we could have done with those three wins. And the fact that I feel like he's been there forever, but the fact that Jalen Daniels has another year of eligibility <laughs> left, it, it gives like Jayhawk fans have like that glimmer of hope still, which I love because it, out of all the fan bases here, like fresh, we've recognized the two fan bases that have really supported this podcast over, over time and year in, year out. I mean, we get some funny ones, like people calling us like closet fans or like telling us we don't know what we're talking about half the time. But the two that really always support us are Kansas and Kansas State. And I, I always thought that was funny that we were like the premier podcast in Topeka and Manhattan, like cool place to be a big podcast at. And maybe we got like D list, E list celebrity status down there. But uh, we're drinking I, I, a bar somewhere. Right. I'm sure maybe someone somewhere in that state would buy us a drink. But I really think that Kansas is that one team that will look back at this year and go, man, we could have really had something special if, you know, one break or something else would have went their way. And then they showed you later on in the season, man, this is a really good football team. I mean, there's three games that I can think of right off the top of my head. It's Atlanta, Illinois, what, week two. And it was early, and then right before the half, they threw a pick six, and the, the wheels kind of fell off there. And then they had UNLV beat, and late in the fourth quarter, it was just, I mean, I'm watching the game. You're kind of like watching a car wreck, like, happening. Like, what is happening right now? They fumble the ball away. They can't recover the fumble from UNLV. The ball gets rolled all around the field, and eventually the Rebels recover it, go in and score and win the ball game. And you're kind of like in disbelief that that just happened. And then – Having a lead on K State in Manhattan, in which they never really, they never beat K State anyway, late in the ball game, and then losing by a point or two um, in the last few seconds. Um, those three losses, if they, if they turn all those into wins, we're having a much different conversation this morning. Right. All right, Fresh. Let's get into rivalry week. We're going to go in the order that the games are going to happen during this week. So this is your very early rivalry games. These are going to be games that are played on Thursday and Friday. We're going to start off with the one Thanksgiving college football game we have. I know Thanksgiving is always set for the NFL, but this is a really good college game on Thanksgiving night. This is at 730. It's kind of sad that the Egg Bowl isn't being played on Thanksgiving night anymore. That had been kind of like a mainstay there. But this one is going to be a big one, a barn burner. It is the Memphis Tigers. They're nine and two. Five and two in the conference. Remember, Memphis had that early season win over Florida State, even though Florida State is very, very bad. Then you got the Tulane Green Wave. They're nine and two, seven and oh in the conference. Both of these teams fighting for a 10 win season. I think 10 wins would be huge for either one of these programs mm-hmm. going, especially into next season. At time of record, we don't really have a line on this game. This game is in Louisiana. For New in New Orleans, there fresh Memphis Tulane, great way to start off the week. Great way to start off the week. This is a game we had circled way back in what May, April, um, right. during during spring practice. Because coming into the AAC, there's a lot of momentum with Memphis coming off of last year. Hennigan and and that entire offense, Mario Anderson, the running back, Rock Taylor, Demir Blum, uh, Blankensy, the receiver. Um, they, they were they were feeling themselves. We kind of thought, hey, they are a dark horse college football playoff contender. Tulane, right. they have 
you know, obviously a good two year run on, you know, the previous two seasons. We didn't really know what John Summerall and all the, you know, the transfers, guys coming in, how they're going to deal with Pratt leaving after graduation last year. Um, where they were going to be at. Like they were, we either going to be go, we don't know if they're going to be a leader or not, like where they're going to stand. John Summerall, what he did at Troy, came in and has gotten this defense playing at an elite level. And the offense, they found their quarterback in Mensa, who has let the team sort of settle down. Him and Makai Hughes run the ball. Mario Williams that received the transfer from USC has really, you know, taken off and, and solidified that number one spot. And this team has just kept winning, kept winning, kept winning. They almost, they, they, they played Kansas State really, really tough back in September. Which we all should, you know, they've done that in the past, but this will set the tone of like, hey, this, these guys are legit. They're the same. They're building a factory there in Tulane. Um, and you can actually make the argument if Tulane and LSU played right now, I'd take Tulane. Um, this, right. this is an interesting football game also because we also thought this could have been the AAC conference championship game matchup, which would have been a back to back week kind of scenario. Um, Army being you know, undefeated until they played Notre Dame and, and clinching a spot kind of jacked it up as well as, you know, Memphis stumbling early in the year and losing two conference games. But it's kind of – you have two elite teams in, in, in the conference who are facing off here with a lot to play on. Number one, Memphis can ruin – or at least – I'm not going to say – they can't really ruin, but they can really ta- uh, take some of the shine off of Tulane season by pulling off the upset here and mm-hmm. getting the win. Because it, it still puts Tulane in the, in the AAC title game. And if they win and Boise State stumbles, and by ranking-wise, they might still be higher ranked. You never know how the mm-hmm. teams get put that. You may be able to steal a spot. For Tulane, you got to come in this ball game. Your focus right now should, should not – just don't look ahead to Army. Don't look ahead to the AAC title game. Focus on Memphis. Because if you take care of business, keeps your record unblemished, and it sets you up to take on an Army team. And if you win that, as I mentioned before, now the committee can look at you and Boise State. Mm-hmm. And if Boise State stumbles in the, in the Mountain West title game, you're that next conference champion in the running. Um, if you lose this ball game, your ranking might be lower. And if Boise State loses to UNLV, who's also ranked, they might still somehow be higher than you and, and steal a spot. You've got to come out with a lot to play on and a lot to stay focused on and go after and attack it. Um, this is going to be a shootout. It, at least on paper, it should be a shootout. I just have a, a weird feeling that John Summer on that two lane defense are going to be ready to go. You kind of look at, Memphis' defense all year has been their Achilles heel. We, we kind of had questions on it coming into the year. We had the offensive talent, but where was his defense with a lot of transfers? How were they going to settle in? They still haven't totally gelled. It's been, especially on the run defensive side, they're giving up a lot of yards on the ground. So how does Tulane take advantage of that? Tulane has only allowed nine points combined in their last three games, and they've only allowed six points in the month of November, a shutout and a, and a three point, and a, and a six point allowance. So their defense is playing at a high level. They're tackling. They're getting after it. Um, the one kind of thing I want to see from Tulane's defense is Patrick. One second. Da, 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 da. Patrick Jenkins, who I had on my number two, uh, second team all preseason all American team. He only has four sacks. He's not getting the pass which he had last year. He obviously he's a focus when it comes to scheming and looking at it. And they have definitely focus on him. But Patrick Jenkins has got to show up now in prime time. These games mean more down the stretch. We're going to need to see him coming off the edge, getting after the quarterback. Four sacks last year. He had nine or ten. He's got to elevate that number down the stretch in the bigger games. If he can, he's going to be in a great spot. Uh, Mensa, being the quarterback like I mentioned earlier, he's a little bit of a dual threat. Has his legs, has his arm. Constantly, he's a freshman getting comfortable with the passing game as he grows. But if he can keep getting the ball to Makai Hughes, who has 1,291 rush yards and 15 touchdowns, and still feeding Mario Williams the receiver spot and scheming around that, who has 41 receptions, three touchdowns, and 701 yards receiving. They're going to be in an okay spot. And a Tulane's defense is the difference maker in this game. If they show up and they play and the offense does enough, Tulane will keep will win this ballgame and keep moving forward and get their face off uh, an, an unblemished conference record versus the Army uh, Black Knights in the American title game and keep their college football playoff hopes alive. It's going to be an exciting ballgame. Definitely being a 7.30 game, you have an hour before that Packers-Dolphins uh, you know, Thanksgiving night game starts. And believe me, that Cowboys Giants game is probably going to watch you to watch real legit football after watching that painful three and a half hour display. So tune into this ball game on ESPN. It's definitely going to be worth your time. Right. And this is the one thing I'm so excited for because when I was looking at the Thanksgiving matchup, like everyone's going to turn, tune in to watch the Lions game. Like that's Thanksgiving tradition. You, that's when the appetizers come out. You probably make your first, you know, drink for the day. You have your dinner around, I don't know what time you eat and your family, though, fresh. We usually eat around 3, 30, 4 o'clock type of dinner time. 
And then you kind of settle in for your Thanksgiving nap, and you're kind of stirring and waking up from the Thanksgiving nap right around kickoff for this game. Folks, if you want to see some really good football, I'm tuning into this Memphis Tulane game here. Here, I think this fresh is one of the byproducts of all of the craziness that's happening in the 2024 season. I think we're missing the fact that the American is the best group of five non-power conference in the country right now. Like, think about how, how competitive this conference is at this time. You have Army, Tulane, Memphis, and Navy right off the jump. You have four teams that have kind of made a huge noise for themselves on what they're able to do. On top of that, you throw in a team like, I'm pulling it, having it pulled South up Florida. right here. South, South Florida. Florida. South Florida, who's giving people trouble. But then take a look at ECU over there in North Carolina. ECU is 7-4 and four on the year, and they are 5-2 and two in the conference there as well. This is a very competitive football conference. And I think that it would be fun to take the, this is where, you know, I go back and forth with the 12 team playoff. I kind of wish that we would take a group of five playoff as well and take the teams in the American and teams in the mountain West and the, and like maybe take a bowling green out of the Mac and like, let them just duke it out. And give them credit because I think there's a lot of really good football playing on over there that people are missing because of, hey, it's look over here, look over here. And you're only you're bringing all your attention to this new 12 team playoff when there's this amazing competitive football league in the country as well that isn't getting the same level of recognition. Now, along those lines, if we went to a 16 team playoff. Would every Division One conference champion, should they be all guaranteed a spot in the playoff? So like the MAC champion, the Conference USA. So I know, like, we're talking about group of five here. Um, cause I think that would be an argument of like, well, an NCAA tournament from college basketball perspective and for baseball and for softball, every conference champion gets, champion gets in. Would, I mean, that, there's definitely a difference when it comes to like Conference USA or Sunbelt. Um, yeah. Even the, like, I think that's a stretch. So I think they have right now, maybe, and you can't say the two best, you know, group of five conference champions, because then you're having that right. slicing and dicing. Um, but, you know, like, imagine if you had a Boise State, a Tulane, a Bowling Green, um, a Louisiana, I think they're leading the Sun Belt right now, and uh, Conference USA, we'll just say Western Kentucky for, for, for giggles. If you had all of them getting a, a, a playoff game, they, they would – Three out of four of those probably would get beat down by somebody else. Um, so you have to have the watchability factor. I think it's, it's, it's a difficult conversation because there's great football being played. I personally love the Mountain West. Um, but it's, it's like, where do you decide that factor of how many of those teams actually get the national showcase and the national stage to display their abilities and compete with the big, you know, heavy, heavy hitters on the power four? Yeah, the one that would give me hesitation is like Jacksonville State, who's leading Conference USA right now. They're yeah. undefeated in Conference USA, but they they got their doors blown off by Coastal Carolina, Louisville, and then lost to Eastern Michigan this year. And Eastern Michigan is a five hundred team in the in in the MAC. They're a five hundred team in the MAC. So I I'd be tough on that one. For me, fresh, this game's going to come down to the two running backs. I think that's going to be the most exciting thing for them. Hughes versus Anderson, which one of them is going to take over the game? You take a look at the two of them. Statistically, they're almost identical. Uh, you take a look. Hughes has got a few more carries than Super Mario over there. But you take a look at Mario's got 16 touchdowns, Hughes 15 touchdowns, both well over 1,000 yards, about 40 more carries for Hughes there as well. If you like great running backs, this is a game to watch. This is old school. They're going to run the football a little bit. They're going to use the run to set up the pass as well. Uh, I'm going to be intrigued to see what kind of tempo Memphis plays. <clears throat> I wish we had a spread on this game. It's early on Sunday morning that we're recording this. We don't have an official spread yet for Thursday. Obviously, Tulane's going to be the favorite. Where Where's the line for you? Like, Where's the point where you go, if I'm getting blank for Tulane, I'd go Tulane. And then if I'm getting this, I'd go Memphis. 
What's the cut? Uh, I would say five and, and six, six or less. I would take uh, two lane. Mm-hmm. If it, if it, and if they gave me double digits, I would definitely be running with Memphis. Mm-hmm. Um, I would too. Points. Uh, I think eight or nine is the, is a fishy area. Uh, I think it's a, it's a one score game probably just because mm-hmm. you're going to see Memphis. This is the, might be, I don't look at two lanes full schedule. This might be outside of Kansas State. This might be the best offense they're going to play all year. Right. Um, so how does that pass rush? That's why I mentioned Patrick, you know, getting after it and, and getting sacked and improving that number. You know, where's that secondary hold up? How does that pass rush get after the quarterback? Especially with the pressure now adding. It's not just a game in September. This is a pressure game for the future of the program, not just to potentially go in with the man of the AAC title game, but keeping their college football playoff hopes alive in terms of ranking and, and sex appeal, eye appeal, eye test, that sort of thing from the committee's perspective. Um, I, I, if it was six, I would take it. Seven. You might stay away. I, 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 I might be okay at borderline, but we start getting higher than like seven and a half. I'd be like, oh, crap, that's basically two scores. That makes it a little, like you know, it puts me on mm-hmm. edge because Memphis can score some points as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Six and a half, I'm probably going to lane. Anything over six and a half, probably up to, uh, I would say eight and a half, nine, I'm probably staying away from the game. When you get nine and a half, I would then start going, okay, I'm going to probably fade Memphis on this one as well. I, I'm almost tempted. I think that they're going to put a high over under in this game, but because both these teams run the ball so well, I'm I'd be intrigued if it's like a 55 over under. I'm probably leaning to taking the under in it. Yeah, and I definitely I trust Summerall's defense. And if they're going to run the ball, play defense, get out of the game, you know, you you want to do what you have to do. You don't want to risk injury for your players because bigger things ahead. So you sort of have to manage that as best you possibly can. Yeah, I, Fresh, I'm going to just because variety is the spice of life, man. I'm going to take Memphis in this game. I'll take Memphis Ooh. for the straight up just because that offense has been electric at times. And again, Tulane does have a very nice defense and they are a bogus pass interference call away from being 10 and one right now. Cause that K state game, there's a terrible pass interference call late in that game. I'll tell you, I, I like Tulane a lot and I'm not going to be like, Oh man, Tulane wins. I think Memphis as well. And I'm going to throw one last thing before we move on to our next rivalry game here. Fresh. Let's say Big 12 decides to expand. Are these the team one and two that they may have circle on their, you know, let's say they're looking to, because the Big 12 is so spread out. Memphis and Tulane would kind of bring them a little more east to go along with West Virginia and UCF. Are these the two teams that they would say, these these would be teams we'd add to our, our conference? I think it'd be great ads because number one, it gets you into the state. Of, it gets you in the state of Louisiana, um, so you have that recruiting, you know, additional recruiting support as well as just notoriety in the in the league there um, to go along with everything in Texas. And then you get that western part of Tennessee with Memphis, um, some of the Delta region. It it and also it makes travel travel easier for Cincinnati, West Virginia, UCF. It's right now, there three of them are out on an island. Um, right. It makes travel. You know, pretty ridiculous for some of those schools. So that right there would build it out and make it a little nice bridging gap. And they're not, they fit that TCU Baylor kind of mentality or Cincinnati model. Right. Oh, that's um, that perfect. It, it's not, they're, you know, if, if you had to, you want to keep it regionalized, would they, they could technically fit in the SEC in theory. Um, Tulane obviously I think was an, well, one of the original members of the SEC, but the, the, the spectrum of size of school and power, they wouldn't fit. It would just, it would, Vanderbilt would still be bigger compared to them in terms of, you know, renounce. Uh, Big 12, I think they fit that market a little better with that TCU, Baylor, Cincinnati mentality. Um, and it would make it uh, a nice little spread across that entire like, southern region. You know, the old Southland Conference basically kicking its wings out to the left and right and north. Yeah, and I think that with Memphis getting that brand new stadium that they're going to get that looks phenomenal. And then on top of yeah, that. That's money, man. Yeah, and then the the on top of that. I think that these teams would easily be competitive given a year or two in the Big 12. Yeah, and I think that would be, you know, they've already seen success at a high level for Tulane, especially in Memphis. They both have made New Year's Six Bowl games in recent memory. Right. So, if, if, and that's where UCF and Cincinnati were appealing to the league. You just got to follow that same model. Yeah. All right, Fresh, let's go to our next rivalry game. This is for the prestige. This is the longest continuously played 
rivalry in college football. It is the Memphis or Minnesota. I've got Memphis on my mind. Minnesota Golden Gophers. They are going to play the Wisconsin Badges. This is going to be in Camp Randall Stadium. Right now, both of these teams, Minnesota gave Penn State all they could handle. You take a look at Wisconsin. They are fighting for bowl eligibility here. Fresh, we talked a little bit off air about this. This game is probably, in the grand scheme of things, doesn't mean a whole lot. I mean, Wisconsin, this means bowl eligibility for them. But really what we were talking about is where is this going to mean for these two programs going forward? Well, I think first off, um, you got to look at, you know, it's hit the cap to Minnesota. Um, I had zero expectations for them coming into the year. And T.J. Fleck and that entire program, it's not sexy. They don't recruit at a high level nationally. They get guys in there who are just lunch pill dudes who work and fight. Um they're they're bowl eligible, and if if you watch that game, they they had Penn State from taken, and if it wasn't for a great James you know Franklin fake punt to really seal the deal, and even then the game was still in, in you know in question down the stretch. Um, Minnesota probably pulls up that huge upset and ruins Penn State's you know year for the most part, and uh, and elevates the program a little bit higher. It PJ Fleck. Yeah, obviously, he's never going to win a Big Ten title. He had his chance no. in a couple of years in the West, and they failed. They choked. Are they going to be that pesky, consistent 6-7 win football team? Anywhere between 6 and 8, they're going to go to bowls? Yes. Um, we're probably not going to see a 9-10 to 10 win team plus ever for Minnesota ever again, just because that league has gotten expanded, so it's going to be tough. But they are going to be hardworking. They're going to beat you up. They're going to fight. Um, and, and that's a, and that's the I think that a great – depiction of and reflection of a head coach itself coming into this game. Are they going to be a little down after almost beating Penn state and having the probably the biggest win and in the, in the last few years of the program? Probably you're going to have a little way to sh- you know, shake it off. If they were playing anyone else, it would probably be tough for them to get back off the mat, you know, mentally and be focused, but they're playing Wisconsin. Now for everyone outside the, the spectrum, the Vikings and Packers, Minnesota, Wisconsin, they hate each other with a, a deep passion. Um, there's a reason why this rivalry is going on. Like, there are people on the border, they punch each other, just like any other kind of rivalry. It's Auburn, Alabama, George, Georgia Tech, um, Texas, Texas a and Carolina, you know, Duke, Carolina. Like, these people hate each other. Minnesota, Wisconsin fans hate each other. The residents of the states hate each other. And that's going to get these guys and their blood up and running. Um, Wisconsin has owned this rivalry in the past 30 years. They've had that axe much more than Minnesota has. And to get the axe back, and to have that win is something that's going to get P.J. Fleck and the Golden Gophers motivated to go into Camp Randall and take care of business, especially because you have a wounded Badger. This Wisconsin program is nothing what they have are in the past. You see former players on Twitter, on social media, wherever it is, um, voicing displeasure with what, PJ, with, what, what um, Luke Fickle has done offensively and just the entire psyche and mentality of this entire program. Barry Alvarez got that program off the map by building an offensive line, and running the football down people's throats three, four yards in a cloud of dust and playing physical, relentless defense. I haven't seen physical and relentless defense consistently from the Luke Fickle Badger team, and their offense has got awful. Um, they have no quarterback. They have offensive line plays terrible. They can't run the football consistently. They don't force turnovers. They can't get sacks. They're, they're an abysmal, you know, a shell of what they used to be. Luke Fickle's got to have this team look in the mirror and figure out what they are and address it. They've obviously fired Phil Longo and that air raid offense is gone, but the entire integrity of who you are needs to change. And right. this, we talk about this thing going back in college football, you know, itself, where some teams, some states, some programs are, they should just be who they are forever. Like trying to change the culture, right? Is, change the culture in the locker room, maybe get people to buy in and want to play, but the staples, the pillars of the program, need to be what they are. Um, Wisconsin is a run-the-football, play hard-nosed, blue-collar, play defense, tackle, be rugged. They develop players. How, you know, like the Watts, T.J. Watt and, and, and uh, J.J. Watt, they weren't five-star recruits. They weren't four-star recruits. They were kids from Wisconsin. I mean, T.J. Uh, came because his brother J.J. was a tight end at Central Michigan, a lowly three-star, maybe two-star recruit comes there, switches to this defensive end, and then takes over and becomes a dominant force. And then TJ follows his footsteps, a guy on the edge, becomes a dominant force 
all those players at Wisconsin, they don't recruit top 15 classes and get national players. They get guys in there and they recruit and develop who want to work and play hard and be physical Midwestern dudes. Um, that mentality, I think Fickle came in trying to be a little too flash and flare like he was at Cincinnati. And you can do that at a lower level. But when you're playing, well, you've got to be dominant in the trenches, and they aren't. They can't run the ball worth a dang. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, this has got to be – you've got to show up this football game, try to save your season, get the sixth win, get to a bowl game, and right. uh, and go forward. And I'm going to honestly say, it's off the top of my memory, I think they have one of the top five longest streaks of bowl games consistently, and that might be in jeopardy come Saturday afternoon or Friday. Um, I think they've been to like 35, you know, 30, 35 straight bowl games. They're 23, 23 years. Wait, all right, 23 straight. They're third. And you have that in jeopardy right now. And, and you got to look back at your season. Who did you lose to that was just – that cost you some – that cost you a bowl game. Um, this, is, this is a bad moment right after the Badgers, and they've got to dig deep. They've got to have the pride, and they've got to come out and just get ready for a rock fight. I don't care if it's 7-3, if it's 6-3. to three, you just got to play defense and run the football. Um, and be physical because right now PJ Fleck and those Gophers they're hungry. They almost beat Penn State, and maybe in, in most cases they should have. And they're going to come in and take and take it out. And one player that's going to do it for Minnesota, wide receiver Daniel Jackson, 69 receptions, 800 yards, and three touchdowns. I mean, Max Brosber has been a stellar quarterback. He came in from you know New Hampshire in the transfer portal. But if he can go out there, right, I, I trust him more than I trust Braden Locke. If he can go out there and just manage the football game and they can run it behind Jerry Taylor with 730 yards and nine touchdowns. They're going to be just fine because that defense from Minnesota is going to stand tall, and they're not going to give up 14 points or more. Um, you've got to find ways to score on defense, special teams, and, and really get off the field. And if not, you're going to be in serious trouble. Walker, Toby Walker, 176, 176 carries, 828 yards and 10 touchdowns. He's got to get the ball 35 times, and he's got to run for 150 for you to have a chance. Don't give up your pride, Luke Fickle. Play defense, play ugly, run the football, and try to get a victory and keep that axe. If not, you're going to be an embarrassment. You're going to be the first team in almost two and a half decades not to go to a bowl game. And that's going to be a pretty stinker right now because you were brought in here to change the program and get them to start competing for Big Ten titles again, and they're nowhere near. They're actually worse off. Um, so this is a, a not just a, a program moment for both these schools. This is a, a, a soul-searching moment for both coaching staff because Minnesota can really dominate and keep the program going forward and keep them down. And Wisconsin, you can fall to the abyss of the Big Ten um, if you lose to Minnesota on Saturday. Fresh, Wisconsin's number three. Who, can you name the two programs that are above them for bowl streak? Georgia. Georgia's one. And number two. Da, 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 da. Two, would be, two would be the difficult one. I'm going to say Boise State. Nope. It is Oklahoma. Wow. Mm-hmm. And did they get their sixth win yesterday versus Alabama? I think they did. So they're going to their bowl game. So, yeah, this is on Wisconsin to show up, put up or shut up. Um, I think Minnesota gets it done. I just don't trust this Wisconsin coaching staff. I don't. I, the program's in a bad spot. I think the Golden Gophers get it done. Um, and from someone who was born in Wisconsin, it's tough to say, I hate Minnesota, I hate the Vikings, I hate the Twins, I hate the Timberwolves, I hate the Wild, I hate the Golden Gophers, but they're the better football team and they're going to get it done. Yeah. Fresh, the intriguing thing with me with Minnesota, and you look back on them, you take a look. They got five losses on the year. Only one of those games is more than one score. Losing to North Carolina to open the season at, at, on a field goal as time expired, losing to them by two points. They lost to uh, the Wolverines by three in Ann Arbor, and there were some questionable calls in that one as well. Lost, to Ruck- lost at Rutgers by a, a touchdown and then last lost last night to Penn State. This Minnesota team is maybe a couple of bounces away from being an eight and maybe an eight and three team. Mm-hmm. You know, you take a look and their wins. A lot of their wins are, you know, 48 nothing Rhode Island, 27 nothing versus Nevada. USC, they beat by a touchdown. UCLA, four. Beat Maryland by 25. Illinois by eight. You know, if you take a look at those one-score games, it looks like the ball has completely gone against them in a one-score game. But anytime they're not in a one-score game, they've won. 
And mm-hmm. it's been an impressive thing by the Gophers. I would say this team realistically probably should be already eight and maybe like eight and three right now. If, if things go the right way, Wisconsin, what's telling me for Wisconsin is that Wisconsin has to, has to figure out where they want to be going forward. Cause Luke Fickle will be firmly on the hot seat next year and being able to go on to, um, and go on to making this program for what it needs to be. Yeah, it's this thing where you have to – I think pride has to come into like, you know, that, we, we talked about in LSU where they are who they are. The fans, the culture, the players, the, the swagger. And you try, you try to change too much, you try to tinker too much, you're going to blow it all up. You have to find that right mix. Um, I think Luke Fickle tried to go too hard on – a, a new and innovative offense, and by putting this air raid type offense with not having a quarterback in place, it just it, it it put a shockwave through who they really are. And the fans, the the defense being rushed back on the field, doing a lot of three and outs, and not running the clock, killing the clock, killing you know slowing the ball game down. It just it hurt it. And until that gets reset in the offseason or quickly, I don't know how to keep recruiting going because kids obviously decommit left and right nowadays. Um, transfer portal. This is a, a critical moment for Wisconsin. If you don't go to a bowl game, with the, how, how are they going to keep momentum on the recruiting trail and keeping kids that, you know, actually at a high level in the program and not transferring out? This is a, a lot at stake right now for Wisconsin in that, in that future. Absolutely. I got Minnesota as well uh, going back to this one. I think Minnesota is going to give to end that streak for Wisconsin. You know who's sitting at for four? Who, has some demons. You know who's four and five? Um, so Ohio State? No. Ohio State member missed a bowl oh, right. game back that's in right. 10. Not under Luke, was it Luke Fickle was the coach? Yep. Boom. There no. we go. That's, no, no. no. Nope. It was he Urban's came in, first it was, year. It was, it was Luke, after Luke Fickle. That's right. Year after Luke. Um, so five, four and five. Oof. Four and five. The only two programs that have 20 year yeah. streaks. There's only five programs that have 20 year streaks. Uh, this should, not <laughs> One of them should be a slam dunk, real easy. Notre Dame? No. Texas? No. Come on. Remember? Florida? Nope. Florida missed the bowl game last year, didn't they? Uh, yes. Al- no, I'm losing it. I'm losing it. Just Alabama. Alabama. Okay. Alabama's four. And then wow. Clemson is five. Clemson's five. 20 years. Okay. You want to know who yeah, the top, okay. who's right below Clemson? Who? This is a good lead in. One of the players in the Iowa? one of the it's Iowa man. Iowa Hawkeyes are the are tied with Ohio State at six. All right, let's go to the next rivalry game. This is going to be played on Friday night in Kinnick Stadium. There, it is the Nebraska Cornhuskers who are bowl eligible once again. <laughs> Storm the field. Storm in the field just to be bowl eligible. Hey, you know what? Celebrate, guys. No, you, I, we celebrate wins, but you know you're down really bad. Right. Um, when you used to be a national championship contender and everything, and you're storming the field because you got six wins or going to a bowl game. Like there's a, I think you lose blue. You have your blue blood status put on pause there for about five years. You have like a, a, a you know, a, a pending you know, uh, period there. Right. You take a look there. They're, they're going to be playing the Iowa Hawkeyes. Iowa is seven and four on the year, five and three in the conference. You take a look, they have been a quiet team this season. They aren't, like, great. They're not terrible. But they've been consistently the same. And that's the thing with Kirk France. He has been a run-the-football type of guy. They have 2,300 yards on the season. They will cross over probably the 2,500 mark in this game. Caleb Johnson, absolute beast. 15, almost 1,500 yards on the season, 21 touchdowns. I mean, this guy has been a monster. And you take a look at that defense, 16 interceptions on the year. I mean, this this is – it seems like the things that don't change every single year, it's Iowa being able to run the football, play defense. That's actually, going back to our conversation, that's what Wisconsin should be striving to be is exactly mm-hmm. what Iowa's doing right now. Nebraska, Matt Rule, again, took, taking over a rough program with having to completely defrost the program there, pun intended. 
he's improving Nebraska. They still have work to do there. I mean, I think, you know, the first thing is Iowa is the model for outside of Oregon, Ohio State. I didn't say outside of Michigan and Penn State. Take take the four of those programs out because USC is just a dumpster fire in Lincoln Riley. The four of them are separate. They're gonna they're gonna recruit nationally at a higher level. They're gonna, they can run offense at a, at a more more pro style. When it comes to everyone else in the Big Ten, they need to follow the Iowa model. Build an offensive line, build a defensive line, run the football, play defense. You know, sprinkle in the passing game off of play action here and there, but the, the three, the four receiver, you know, spread offenses, air raid nonsense, it's not going to work. I don't even care if it's 60 degree weather in October and it's, you know, optimal for, for throwing the football around. It's, it, it's not going to get it done. You're not going to have, yes, Big Ten schools go down to Texas, California, Georgia, and Florida and recruit. You go down and you pick those players up. But you can only go get so many kids from so many places, you know, across the country. You've got to figure out who you are in your region, who you are at, a, at the core of your soul. Iowa does it correctly. This year, they obviously made a change to offensive coordinator, and they add a little more of the passing game. But it's still, they're running for almost 2,500 yards as a team. Um, and, the, and they're pounding out and playing great defense, controlling the clock, and sprinkling in much more efficient third down and first and second down passing attacks. Um you know, Cade McNamara's not throwing for 30 touchdowns. They're not having four receivers on the field. You know, the only, honestly, the only wide receiver that I actually remember from Iowa, they have tons of tight ends, they have tons of offensive line, and they have great, you know, they have solid running backs and great defensive players. The only receiver that sticks out in my mind is Tim Dwight. And he was more of a kick return for Iowa than he was actually a wide receiver. Um, you need to, this mentality still works and still successful. It just be more creative in your pass game and sprinkling in a little more of the you know play action to help you survive. Iowa does it well. Kirk Ferentz and that entire program they they know who they are. Um, they get guys who are they don't they don't get five star running backs. They don't get four star running backs. They get dudes in that program who want to work you know work hard and be developed and fight every single day in practice and earn their spot and contribute. That's who most of these teams in the Big Ten are, and there's nothing wrong with it. You got to get guys in there. You know, you recruit high at the offensive and defensive line spots and you develop everywhere else. You make sure you hit on your players and you have them invest in a program and the pride of the program. And that's where you see a lot less kids in the transfer portal from some of these more stalwart programs who have development plans in place. These kids aren't hitting the portal in Iowa at, you know, at a crazy deal. They aren't hitting the portal, you know, at, at Illinois. They're actually attracting pieces to fit in and, and make the program better. Um, it, this is like a culture thing where you have to start from the very top down. Iowa does a fantastic job at it. Matt Rule and what he's done at Nebraska, year three in his previous two stops at Temple and, and Baylor have always been that year where they take off. This is year two. You're sort of seeing them take some lumps. You've seen them have some success. You've seen them have some bad losses. I mean, they got absolutely eviscerated by, Nebraska, by Indiana and they stood, they got themselves, dusted themselves off and gave Ohio State all they could handle. And in, some ways, they actually might have won that ball game. Some if the ball bounces their way a couple times, mm-hmm. um, they took care of Colorado, um, and they come out here with all the line. Two games to go between Iowa, and Wisconsin, and I honestly think they had to beat Wisconsin because the, the chances versus Iowa are a little tougher to get to back to bowl eligibility. And they went out there. He Matt Rule sucked his pride a little bit and hired Dana Holgerson to come in and be the office coordinator. Now Dana's like, "Well, I was bored," but Dana can he can coach offense. He's done it for many years, and they came out there. And they put it on. He got Dylan Rayola looking a little more confident. He's still a freshman. He's had struggles, 12 touchdowns, 10 interceptions. Um, but he, he looked a little more comfortable in the offense and a little more confident in, in, from that perspective. Nebraska, if they can elevate that, get some players in there and add a little more to the running game. Cause I don't see a dominant running game right now, but it's, they're just, they're there. They're not, you know, amazing. The leading rusher, Dante Dowell, 564 yards and 11 touchdowns. They get touchdowns. They're not getting the yards. Um, if they need to keep you know elevating an offense. They'll be okay. This is going to be a cool game though for Nebraska also to test them. Where's their mentality? At? You finally got back to your bowl game. How can you shake that off in a short week and get back to focus and play Iowa? Um, mm-hmm. Are you happy to be at six wins or do you want to have seven wins? Do you want to continue to keep getting better? Then we'll know really where Matt Rule's gotten this guy's at. Are they mentally ready for now? You've gotten to this pillar on your chart. Can you actually now win with expectation to be a good team, or are you just going to be six and six um, and be average? So that's going to be another little benchmark there for what Matt Rule's doing in Nebraska. 
Um, happy for, for Nebraska back, getting back to a bowl game. I still find it funny that you did rush the field, but hey, live success, enjoy it, live it up. I think this game is going to be very low scoring. I think this game is going to be, you know, a nice little slobber knocker, if you will. The old hog Miley's, like Keith Jackson used to say, are going to be playing heavily. Um, but in the end, I think Iowa Hawkeyes take care of business. Um, just because they have much more of that offensive, defensive line integrity and that secondary is really solid. You know, the most intriguing thing that Iowa's done recently is they made the move to Jackson Stratton. And he was the starting quarterback for the Maryland game this week. You take a look, and they're still going to feature a heavy dosage of Caleb Johnson. Ran 35 times last week for over 100 yards again. What, what else is new? But I look at Iowa, and I'm not saying you need a guy like uh, a Patrick Mahomes or even like a Jalen Milrow or – I'm just trying to think. Even like – even you don't even need like a guy like Dylan Rayola where you're throwing the ball all over the football field. What you need is a quarterback who can – he is a game manager. And I know that, that that statement sometimes carries a negative connotation. But it got, you know you're going to have a good offensive line. You know you're going to have a good running back. And you talked about Iowa recruiting. If I'm Iowa and I'm Kirk Ferentz, I'm going down into Texas and Florida, and I'm selling my, I'm finding like the best running backs and going, I will deliver you an amazing offensive line. We will recruit a great offensive line for you to run through, and they are going to open up huge holes for you. And you're going to be a, Yes, you're not going to have the glitz and glamour of, of being at LSU or Texas, you, or you know, you're not going to be. You're going to be living in the state of Iowa, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get you to the league. I am going to develop you. You're going to be playing behind NFL level offensive linemen, guys who are going to make the league. If that entices you, come to Iowa. And if they were able to get a quarterback, and maybe Jackson Stratton's it. He's from La Jolla, California, went to Colorado State last year, entered the transfer portal. He's a 6'4 sophomore, game manager type of kid. But if he's able to hit the play action, and again, what does Iowa always have? Run game, offensive lineman, good defense, and tight ends. All they really need, game manager, quarterback, and maybe like one speedster wide receiver, you know, go to the – state championship track and field in Iowa and find the guy who wins the hundred meters in the state of Iowa say, all right, we'll teach you how to catch a football. If they were able to do that, Iowa could enter in. Cause I feel like everyone talks about the big 10 being top heavy and, it, and it's, they're true. It's right. But the, and they're like, Oh, there's these teams at the top and then everyone's at the bottom. And I, the only team that I would look at would be Iowa and saying Iowa is the team that is in between the two because they don't, I don't ever want to group them in with the bottom part of the big 10. They're they're not the Purdue. They're not, you know, Northwestern, but they're also not at the top of the level too. I think that they're a player or two away and Kirk Ferentz is amazing at developing kids for the NFL. And I think that this is kind of the, the game that we're going to see going into next year of which one of these programs can be like, maybe like Indiana, like in the top level, but at the bottom of the top level, almost like that. If you have, this is group one, a, they're going to be in that one B or level uh, tier two status. Well, they're uh, quarterback it's, away. It's kind of like in the, like, you know, everything's like black and white, but in this case, there's always, there's always a gray area when you look at it. And I think right. Iowa's the gray area where you have a black and a white, but then in the middle, like, they're, they're a little of both. And they're in that, tree, you know, like, there are years where Iowa, obviously, they put it all together and they have a, a really good year. Um, they develop tons of players, get them to the league. They're very competitive. They pull up an upset, especially at home in Kinnick at night. Um, and then you have years where they just, yeah, they're they're seven and five or six and six, and the record is actually looks better than the product on the field. So you have sort of both, uh, but they are, you know, they're they're that that, that they're, they're like the I think mean, fifth to seventh in in the league every single year. Yeah, and I I think that they could make that little bit of jump if they if they found the quarterback. And again, I make that sound so easy. I make it sound so easy, and it's not easy to find that guy. 
I think they were, I think honestly between them and Wisconsin and Nebraska, the three of them, well, and Minnesota, so the four teams we already talked about this morning, they were the ones hurt the most by Oregon and USC and UCLA and Washington coming to the league. Right. Um, if Penn State, Michigan, Michigan's going to have recruiting, they, they have NIL money that will run deep, like Fort Knox. We already seen that this week. Um, mm-hmm. Ohio State, Michigan, and, and Penn State are going to be there. Oregon's going to be there. USC is going to have the glitz and glamour of LA. Um, it's, it's those, those old Midwestern programs that were used to be uh, every once in a while, they would get that fine way to get it done and compete for a Big Ten title and, you know, make a run. But now with the league being expanded and playing a little more of an ath- having more athletes or you have to change who you are and you're maybe recruiting spectrum now where I'm in the Big Ten, I'm going to go to Washington if I'm on the West Coast instead of actually coming to Wisconsin or Iowa and making that trip from California in. So it's, they got hurt a little bit more than I think they did from a football perspective. Basketball, I think the league's in great shape, but football, they got hurt a little bit more because of this expansion. Yeah. All right, Fresh, let's go to the marquee game early in rivalry week. It is good old-fashioned hate. It is Georgia Tech going to Athens to face the Georgia Bulldogs. Nor In years past, this has not been the same level of the game that it at, one, at one point once was, but these Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets this year, they have been scrappy as all get out. You take a look at what they've done this year. They have they beat Miami. They have kind of been competitive with everyone on their schedule outside of maybe the Notre Dame and, and Virginia Tech game. Georgia, it's been a a roller coaster of a ride for you. And again, it depends on which version of Carson Beck you're going to get. Great Carson Beck will will take this team and make Georgia look unstoppable. Uh, Ice Age Sid Carson Beck needs to have, you know, luckily, I think Georgia Tech, to, Georgia Tech will wear white at this game, I take it. Yes. So, yes. so Carson, Carson, Georgia players are wearing red this week. They aren't wearing the white jerseys. Throw it to the guys in red. When he knows those things, he does very, very well. Well, I think even a deeper issue, it's it's the offensive line for, for the dogs. If they can get themselves sort of settled, he's actually shown some progress the past couple of weeks. But when they get settled, um, in his protection, if you watch all the film, in his protection, he has time, play action on top of it. He's looked okay. It's when he was getting rushed, especially that Ole Miss game where that Ole Miss defensive line, which they were not existent for Florida, it, it, when they were uh, disrupting and getting in the backfield and blowing up the running game and, and putting them in long, you know, third and long situations, second and long situations, that pass rush is, you know, relentless against an offensive line that's still trying to feel itself out, wasn't 100% healthy. They are health, 100% healthy yet. Nobody is. There's no team in the country right now at this point of the year that is 100% healthy. Everyone's beat up and, and, and dinged up. Um, it's, it's, if the offensive line can stay healthy, stay you know upright, and be physical at the point of attack, that's where it allows the offense, and I don't know who you are, not just Carson Beck, not just the dogs, anybody, you're going to be a good spot. So that's the biggest key because – you know, I'm sort of looking at Georgia Tech, and you mentioned them, how they've improved. Brent Key is a former Georgia Tech offensive lineman, and what he brought to this entire program when he came on as an assistant but now becoming the head coach is physicality, toughness, and complete just utter disregard for your opponent. They are going to punish you and beat you up. Um, they have no trouble with a 18-play, 85-yard drive in 10 minutes and three yards in a cloud of dust and just punishing you, punishing you, punishing you. With the run game, um, that is who they are. You know what? A lot of football football guys, football people love that because that is truly. Um, you know, that's why we love RB and Navy. We see them out there; they just run the ball down your throat. Um, point the point of contact, only the line of scrimmage, and dominate from that perspective. And that is, you know, what has gotten Georgia Tech and then turned around after the Jeff Collins era so quick is that they are found who they are. They know who they are. They're going to run the ball, be physical, play aggressive defense, and control the clock. Haynes King is a, a very mobile quarterback, and Georgia struggles with mobile quarterbacks. He's definitely had some injury concerns all year. He's been in and out of the lineup. But when he plays and he's explosive, he can make a serious difference with his arm and his leg. Aaron Philo, the quarterback, the back of quarterback, the freshman from Prince Avenue, uh, just outside of Athens, if you're around there, you know, in high school, he threw the ball all around the yard. The dude has an arm, has a cannon. He's much more of the passing quarterback, and they've rotated him in the lineup a lot lately. Number one, because he can throw the ball and it helps their offense be a little more explosive, but running the game, he does have a little, you know, 
uh, mobility as well to add in that factor. But he's the future at quarterback. But the two of them coming in under the lineup, it gives them different variations, a lot of different things to happen from the offensive side. Jamal Haynes, the running back, has been really, really good all year. He's been really good his entire career. If he gets going, they're going to be in great shape. And then the receivers, Rutherford and Singleton Jr., have are, are, are solid playmaking receivers, whether it's getting, you know, end around handoffs, bubble screens, catching down the field. They can make plays, and they have to be eyes on them at all times because they have shown in multiple games, especially versus Miami, to make big plays when it matters the most. There is talent on this offense for Georgia Tech, and the defense has playmakers all around, especially in the secondary and at the defensive end position. They're going to make things hell for the dogs. Coming into this ball game, um, if Georgia wasn't going to SC championship game, this game actually was going to be very, very important because if Georgia lost, they would be out of playoff consideration altogether. Um, having the SC championship game as a, a mulligan, if you will, if they lose, if they win that game, they're in. If they lose, they're probably out. At least there's some sight of they have a chance to save themselves in a one, a win and in scenario. But you never want to put it in the committee's hands. You never want to put it up for that one, you know, end, end of the round. You've got to take care of business. And being against a rival will get your attention. Uh, this past week, if you had seen any of the highlights, that Georgia defense couldn't tackle a, a dang thing anywhere on the field. It was a struggle bus for UMass and a mobile quarterback once again. Um, yeah, it was 59-21, to but if you watch that ball game, they were running the ball down, their throat, down, down Georgia's throat in the first quarter, especially from the quarterback's perspective, and that's a very worrisome sight going forward especially coming off of a game where you contained and, and eliminated that running in from Tennessee. Where's Georgia's defensive mentality set at? Did they just lay down because it was UMass and they weren't really caring? Were they playing vanilla defense and actually prepared more for the future? Uh, where, where's the energy? Where's the intensity? Um, that's got to be flipped on on Friday night between the hedges if they are going to you know, keep momentum building for this down stretch. Because right now, there is no next week mentality. It is you have to keep winning or is win or else, win or else. And you have to have that focus of if we lose, our season's over. If we win, we keep moving on. And that starts with the defense and the tackling, which has been abysmal all season. Executing, getting, you know, focused on where your assignments are, communicating, and being locked in. Georgia Tech is going to push the dogs to the very limit. They're going to be physical, and you have got to be able to match that intensity and that physicality because if you don't bring the juice, you're going to be in trouble. Um, offensively, Georgia – Maybe they found a running game. Nate Frazier, the first dog to have a hundred yards, hundred yard game this season. It didn't happen until week 13 of the year, which is shocking. Um, we talk about brands and who people are. Georgia is running the football. Um, and not being able to get a hundred yard rusher in a, you know, for a single individual effort until week 13 versus UMass is, is pretty scary. And that's got to change. ETN's got to get healthy. Frazier's look good. He's got to find ways to get that running game going much more. Um, down the stretch, if they're going to have anything and that starts on Friday night in, you know, in, in Sanford Stadium. This is a big, big game. It's a rivalry game. Brent Key and Georgia Tech are going to show up with everything on the line, ready to fight and scrap and claw and pull out all their tricks. Um, I expect former Georgia offensive staffer, uh, Buster Faulkner, the offensive coordinator now for Georgia Tech, to really pull out some stuff. He loves 12 personnel. I expect to watch a lot of power game, a lot of play action, to challenge those linebackers from Georgia and really pen penetrate and a lot of zone read action on the edges to see if they'll actually contain. This is going to be a, a true brawl. It's, it was a brawl last year. Um, the, the, the vibes have changed right now in, in Georgia Tech football. I think it's really, really cool to see them at a high level and competing, but Georgia cannot take them lightly. They've got to be ready because you have this game, the SC championship game, and who knows after that future-wise, you've got to win football games and keep yourself alive. Tech, this is another building block in that program. If they can win this ball game, just imagine you beat – Two top 10 teams, Miami and Georgia, in the same year, um, ruining potentially both their seasons, you know, in, in theory, and uh, setting yourself up to really show that Georgia Tech is back. So there's a lot on the line here. Clean old-fashioned hate for a reason. Um, I think this, if Georgia had beaten, if beaten UMass with ease and had no issues, they would be looking past um, Tech a little bit. But I think Tech has their full focus. It's going to be a brawl. It's going to be a 60-minute fight. I think Georgia wins by a field goal. Um, it was going to be a, a battle. Um, but Brent Key and that tech team is really elevating. I think they're going to be serious contenders in the ACC next year and going forward. Three keys for me for this game, Fresh. One, I need to see, I need to see Georgia come out and just stifle someone defensively. I've been waiting for that the chokeout game where it is seventeen nothing at halftime, 
yeah, the scoreboard says like, okay, you're still only, you know, two touchdowns and a field goal down, but you have just choked out the other team's offense that there's no way that they're going to even be able to make up that seven, those 17 points. No way, no how. The other thing too, Georgia's got to avoid any, this is going to be a very physical football game. It is going to be a very physical football game. And I think you're going to get one of the best shots from Georgia Tech. What I need to see from Georgia, though, is that you get through this game without experiencing a major injury. That And that's the scary part about a game like this. I honestly think Georgia is going to win, and I think it's going to be bigger than a, than a field goal type of game. I actually think Georgia is going to, by the end of it, is going to be a double-digit win. I think it's going to be a 10 plus win for this football game because it, it will be very physical in the first half. And I think eventually there's going to be a break or two, you know, Georgia tech only has five interceptions of the year. If they were one that was able to really pressure the quarterback force a lot of turnovers with that stuff. And you take a look, Georgia tech, 15 sacks on the year. They don't generate a ton of pressure and they don't generate the turnovers, they have that bend, don't break defensive mentality, and they're going to h- try to hold you to three instead of seven. I think sooner or later, those chickens are going to come home to roost for, for tech, and Georgia's going to take advantage of it. But in a game like this, this is where you don't want that freak injury to happen. That's this type of game where you're going to be like, I know we're better, the better football team. I know this team's going to come in and smack us in the mouth and try to hit us pretty hard. We're going to win eventually, but we just got to come out scot-free in it because everything is going to be on the line next week in Atlanta. When you get to the, when you get to the SEC title game, and the fact is that losing to Alabama and losing to Old Miss, both now who have three losses, you make the title game you are going to be playing with – you're playing with fire here. You lose to Tech here, and you you talked about having the mulligan. It is winner to get in. Mm-hmm. Probably versus I, Texas, which is not yeah, good. Texas. And you take a look at this and go, all right, we beat Georgia Tech. And let's say it is – let's go with your premise here of going like – let's say it's a three three-point win. And it's a tough, hard-fought game, and they go up against Texas again. It is a very debatable thing if, let's say, Texas wins the SEC title game. Now you have, really, the argument is going to maybe between Alabama and Georgia on which team gets that that third spot for the SEC. Does the you now all of a sudden things. right and and. And you you have everything is in your control now. Everything is in front of you, and all it is is winner winner kind of go home, winner go home. It, it goes back to old as you made mention earlier for the NCAA tournaments. It's, it's winner go home for for the Bulldogs here. I Georgia is a really really good football team, and this is the crazy thing with with where their expectations have been. We talked last year about how. When you win national titles, it is be made sky high expectations, and then things start to become that you kind of were like, oh, okay, it'll be okay. It certain things that were acceptable or understandable are no longer acceptable or understandable with them. This is where the SEC is so interesting because this is the year Saban's gone. I don't care that Saban. You know, had one national title or what have. Saban was the king of the SEC. It, no way around it. Alabama, Saban were always going to be kings of the SEC as long as he was there. All of a sudden, the king is gone, and it's it, it feels like Game of Thrones, where everyone is fighting for the crown. And we all looked at Kirby Smart in Athens, Georgia, and said, well, that's the prince right there. That's the prince. He should be the first one to take the crown. And you had Lane Kiffin, you had Sark, you had all these other people who were saying Brian Kelly in LSU, Heupel in Tennessee, the Boar. They're all fighting to keep that to, that they want that crown. I don't as necessarily know if this is going to be decided this year, and if we can really crown who's going to be that that team to beat in the SEC. This is. 
the top of the SEC has so much parity. And again, we're not talking enough about teams like South Carolina, which I'm very high on South Carolina. Mm -hmm. I still am. I think there's a lot of great thing uh, Shane Beamer is doing there in Columbia. But this is a game where if Georgia blows out Tech, or at least gives the appearance of a blowout. You know, the first quarter was tight and they pull away. They win by, let's say, 17. And the scoreboard, the people who are scoreboard watching will be like, oh, well, G- Georgia won by 17. And then the one fans who watch the game go, Georgia battled for that 17. They got some breaks at the end. They got, got to 17. Great win by them. They got to stay healthy, got to avoid the loss, and have to really have the choke out game by the defense there. Those three things – Georgia does that. I think the committee is going to be watching this game pretty closely because they need to have a reason to understand. And again, I think I heard a lot of people saying we have no idea how the committee is going to honor teams that make their conference title game. And again, those games are about the best of the best within the conference. They're going to be toss up games. What happens to the loser in the conference title game? I, mean, like, I think Oregon and Ohio State both are in. I don't care who wins or loses that game. Right. So that, that's gonna be, that, that really is going to be deciding who's the, who's the one seed in the country and, and who's, who's the, the five. five right. Um, I think SMU and Miami, unless I – mean, if Miami loses to Syracuse this week, then that really puts their uh, – them in doubt. They have to win to get in. But I think right. if they win, it's going to be SMU-Miami. One's going to be in one of the four seeds, and one's going to be in. I think the Big 12, with what happened yesterday, they're down to one team and one team only. Um, Talk about crazy. And, I mean, that's going to be – and it looks like Arizona State is in the championship game in most scenarios playing out. So, interesting the way that plays out. But it comes down to if Georgia struggles with Tech, then that three losses, you're like, all right, well, is Tennessee's two losses still better even though Georgia beat them on the field by two touchdowns and they had to play an extra game? But Alabama beat Georgia, and Georgia had to play an extra game and got the third loss. Like, they start playing that, that – where's that 13 game come into play? And in mm-hmm. the past, there's been a precedent set. In 2018, Georgia was undefeated in the SEC championship game, lost in the second half, overtime comeback by Jalen Hurts and Alabama, got left out of the playoff. Um, 2021, Alabama didn't even play in the title game, and they got in the playoffs. In 2017, Auburn played in the SEC title game, Georgia beat them. Alabama did not, and Alabama got in the playoff. Last year, undefe- last year was different because there was a lot, there was more teams in contention. But Georgia had coming off of two straight national championships, lose by three in the SEC title game, and get left out of the playoff. Um, the committee, they the way they view those championship games, and I'm, I'm obviously just using SEC you know, as one example, but showing that they just look at it as an L. They don't look at it as we're playing an extra 13th game when most teams are only playing 12. So. Um, obviously, there's no verbiage in the bylaws of 12 games, 13 games, just a season and best teams available. So um, there's a lot of the line. So it's, it behooves Georgia to come out and put their foot down on Georgia Tech like they did versus Texas. That was 22 to nothing at halftime, and they beat the trash out of Texas. Uh, and they, put, they kind of let them back in the game in the second half, but that first half was dominant. You come out and you lay the wood to Tech, you put it down, it puts more in people's minds of, all right, this is a legit 10 2 football team. They're playing a 13th game of the season. Um, they're one of the 12 best in the country, and you want to leave that image in someone's mind um, and then not get blown out if you do lose in the SC title game. You've got to keep that a close football game, make it competitive. But you have to play that. Now we are in the eye test sex appeal game um, where you have to keep that focus in play of, if I have to score another touchdown just for the heck of it, I will, just to make sure that that solidifies that win margin, whatever it has to be, to add that extra layer. Um, and, and it's in it, you're, you're playing for your lives, and you're, you're putting, you're putting your, your future in 12 to 15 people's hands, which is never good. You wanted to decide on the field, win a title, mm-hmm. do it impressively, and keep their doubt and their interpretation out of, their, out, out of play. Right. It'll be, it'll be very fascinating to watch to see how the committee reacts. And then there's, something, there's even questions to be asked. Like, let's say Boise wins out and Tulane just blows out Memphis this week and then blows out Army. There's always this – if there's so much un, unfathomable chaos at the top, could even a second group of five teams sneak in? I don't know the answer to that. That will be 
we'll have to see how the results fall. Maybe a better discussion once we have some results in. But Fresh, this is Rivalry Week Part 1 of 3. Hey folks, hit that subscribe button because you do not want to miss what we have coming out this week. This is our favorite week to talk college football all year long. So hit that subscribe button, hit the notification bell, get notified Every single time this week, we drop a new episode because they are coming out and we will have everything out. We have so many more games to talk about. We're we're excited that we're finally here. It is the culmination of a great regular season. And then we move on to the real discussion about the playoff. So make sure you're checking out spinablesports.com. There's a bunch of great stuff over there. Special thanks to our producer, Drew. Without him, none of this is possible. Make sure you're checking us out on the social media interact with us, engage with us on X. There's a large discussion going out there with two different questions on social media, whether or not Florida deserves to be rated in the top 25 right now after a big win over Ole Miss. And if you are a playoff committee member, what would be most, not saying other things aren't important to you, but what would be most important to you? So check those out, interact with us, engage with us, leave us the comments below, tell us what your thoughts are and how excited you are for Rivalry Week. Fresh, that's all I got, because we got to prepare for the next two episodes we still have for this week. All right, this is the best weekend of football period of all time, every single year. Um, with Agreed. NFL and college, everything going across the board, football all the time. So enjoy it, embrace it, folks, because – the games get fewer, but they get more important as we move down the stretch into January. And with that, hit us up on Spinnable Sports YouTube, SpinnableSports.com, and both of our social media as well as the Rational Confidence Podcast on all platforms. And with that, we'll talk to you all later. Bye, y'all.